Welcome to the course Translation Studies. I am Stensa Agustin from the Department of English, Christ College, Irinyalakuda. In this course, we will study the origin and history of translation, types of translation, and how to translate poems, prose, dramas, and other articles. We will be focusing more on the theory since practical side has limitations online. However, the instructors have tried their best to include practical sessions that will guide you to improve translation skills on your own. Translation studies as a discipline was accepted very recently, but it is very rarely studied as a subject of its own since foreign language teaching involves a lot of translation. Translation involves the rendering of a source language that is SL text into the target language that is TL so as to ensure that the surface meaning of the two will be approximately similar and the structures of the SL will be preserved as closely as possible but not so closely that the TL structures will be seriously distorted. So this is pretty much what we do in translation. If we look into the origin of translation, there is a story in the Bible about a Tower of Babel in Genesis 11th chapter. The story goes like this. The entire human race spoke a single language. They had unity. One day, they all agreed to build a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Yahweh, the God, observing their city and tower, confounded their speech so that they could no longer understand each other and scattered them around the world. Similar narratives can be found in many other myths from different parts of the world. Now, if you look into the story, there is a reference to the lack of translation causing chaos and division. The recognition of translation in ancient Rome was equal to creative writing. Romans translated and imitated Greek texts and took pride in being able to transfer great knowledge from Greek to Latin. For them, translation was helpful in practicing public speaking and debate. However, there was a confusion among the early translators like Cicero, Horace and Quingilian about the type of translation to adopt. They argued whether word for word or sense for sense is the right way to translate. This was because any error in the target text may deem the translator as a heretic and can get him burned at the stake. This was especially true in the case of religious texts. During the spread of Christianity in the Western world, translation also had an evangelical role. Disseminating the word of God was seen as a holy assignment. Christianity, being a text-based religion, heavily depended on translators to influence the people. The early translations of Old Testament were only for the Greek-speaking Jews. After the time of Jesus, Bible in its today's contents got translated from Hebrew, Aramaic and Koine Greek to first Latin and to many other languages. The first complete Bible translation in English was by John Wycliffe in the 14th century. It was followed by versions like Tyndale's, Coverdale's, the Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible and lastly King James Bible. The King James Version published in 1611 was one of the most important books in English literature. Translating Bible into English also carried a political function since it signified the detachment of the English layman from the Latin Bible. And this meant the breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. This would later change the face of the country as it became the most dominant imperial power in Europe until the Second World War. In 14th century, Geoffrey Chaucer popularized the vernacular by writing in English language. But then again, his sources were mostly Latin works. In the early years of the 15th century, Renaissance humanists insisted that the capacity to translate texts from Greek and Hebrew into Latin and later into and between vernacular tongues was a critical aspect of grammar and rhetoric. When performed by students, schoolmasters claimed that translation and double translation facilitated eloquence in both languages. It is said that Queen Elizabeth I could translate religious texts from English into Latin, Italian and French by the time she was of age 12. 
Though writers like Thomas More primarily focused on their Latin scholarship by showing it off in their writings, others like Roger Ascombe promoted vernacular diction rather than sprinkling foreign terms into their writings. A notable translation of Elizabethan period was George Chapman's translation of Homer's Iliad in 1598 and Odyssey which came out in 1660. This was most popular in the English language and was the way most English speakers encountered these poems. This was also the first complete English translation of Homer until Alexander Pope's translation of the same published in the 1720s. Though writers like Thomas More primarily focused on their Latin scholarship by showing it off in their writings, others like Roger Ascombe promoted vernacular diction rather than sprinkling foreign terms into their writings. A notable translation of Elizabethan period was George Chapman's translation of Homer's Iliad in 1598 and Odyssey, which came out in 1616. This was the most popular in the English language and was the way most English speakers encountered these poems. This was also the first complete English translation of Homer until Alexander Pope's translations of the same published in the 1720s. A significant historical event that boosted the translation practice in Europe was the printing revolution in the 15th century. Books became easily available compared to the medieval era when books were only hand copied. Printing press had a fundamental role in standardizing languages across Europe. In 1473, the first English book was printed by an English merchant and translator William Caxton in Belgium. The book was Recail of the Histories of Troy, in other words, History of Troy, translated from French by Caxton himself. Caxton later set up his printing press in Westminster, London in 1475. He published Chaucer's Canterbury Tales there and translated many European books into English solely for the sake of printing and selling them. The period of European colonialism in the later centuries witnessed a sort of violent translation. This was done on Asian and Middle Eastern texts when they got translated into Western languages. An absolute disregard for the knowledge of East was obvious in Thomas Babington Macaulay's Minutes of 1853, where he said about Indian education, a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia when we pass from works of imagination to works in which facts are recorded and general principles investigated. The superiority of the Europeans becomes absolutely immeasurable. Now we have a general idea of how translation became an important area of scholarship and how certain perspectives distorted the original meaning of source texts, consequently leading to misunderstanding of certain cultures. Let's analyze what does translation mean today. As an academic field, studying about translation rather than learning how to translate was established in the 20th century. In the 20th century, translation studies regained a footing in literary criticism through Russian formalism. By the 1950s, early experiments with machine translation had started. Since 1965, great progress has been made in translation studies. The work of scholars in Netherlands, Israel, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union, the German Democratic Republic and the United States seems to indicate the emergence of clearly defined schools of translation studies, which place their emphasis on different aspects of the whole vast field. Translation studies is now bridging the gap between the vast area of stylistics, literary history, linguistics, semiotics, and aesthetics. But one shouldn't forget the fact that it's a field firmly based on practical application.